To be or not to be? That's a famous choice. Most people think that humans, if not all animals, can make choices. That is, they can control what they do, and they're not just ruled by the laws of physics. Philosophers throughout history have long debated this, with materialists on one side, who think of the body as a kind of machine, and on the other side, anti-reductionists, who think that choice can't be explained by interactions of matter and energy alone. So what does the word choice really mean? And what do we imagine happens in our bodies when we make choices? When we come to a decision fork, what happens in our brains when we decide to go right or left? And what do we mean by we anyway? What makes my decisions? Myself, a little person in my head? We know that thoughts emerge when there's activity in the neurons of the brain. And groups of neurons fire in patterns and complex webs of interaction. But how would we, ourselves, control that? with other thoughts or feelings? Does a previous thought pattern guide the next one like a lever switching a pathway? No, that's not how it works. Choices don't involve one thing physically pushing another. Choices happen in humans and in animals when the probability of what can happen is constrained. So constraints don't determine outcomes in the same way that material causes do with physical contact or direct energy transfer, like a man pushing the stone to the right place. Constraints narrow possibilities. They allow things to fall into order. For example, the shape of an H2O molecule falling onto others constrains the way it gets fixed. An ice crystal isn't placed in the right spot. It falls into a pattern. You could say that you're purposeful insofar as you make your own luck. Your body is evolved and developed to constrain the probability that the appropriate things will happen by chance, like ice crystals building up on a snowflake. Constraints make it probable that the appropriate thoughts will emerge. And by appropriate, I just mean thoughts that are characteristic of you, the kind of person that you've become in your experiences. Your personality is like a organic, dynamic crystal, ever adapting and changing, but constraining at the same time. Artists have long associated creativity and freedom to choose with chance and constraints. Constraints, like having to rhyme in poetry, can force an artist to think in unusual ways and often make some sort of chance association. It may seem strange to think that constraints, which are limits really, can lead to freedom to choose. But when things fall into a more orderly arrangement than not, this order is the background against which your choices make sense. Purposeful action may not be ruled by the laws of physics, but making a choice doesn't mean breaking any laws either. Purposeful actions, choices, are really just events that are unlikely to occur, very unlikely to occur, by material causes alone. Constraints also affect the way things turn out. Whenever we find anything in nature that is all randomly mixed up, like these molecules bouncing around via inertia, we know there aren't really any constraints biasing the direction of the outcome. The only constraint here is the box itself, which keeps the molecules from flying away. We can introduce a formal constraint just by adding difference. Temperature difference affects buoyancy. Here flow is directional because of some difference in the material itself. Some molecules are hotter and some cooler. Boiling liquid is actually more orderly than warm liquid. This is what a thin film of boiling oil looks like close up or with thermal infrared photography. As Gregory Bateson pointed out, a difference can make a difference. Add heat to a pan of liquid and you get order spontaneously, that is, without anyone specifically directing the molecules which way to go. 
Michelangelo painted God separating light from darkness. You can think of God here as a formal cause, a difference that makes a difference. It's cool, really, if you think about it. Genesis describes creation by differentiation, order emerging out of chaos. But formal cause in itself doesn't lead to the ability to choose. With formal cause, things go in limited directions, not every which way. But they aren't limited by meaningful choices. There's no life yet, because before there is life, there must be meaning. Formal cause alone is like an abstract art show. There's no meaning to any of it, no representation. Something is meaningful when it represents something else, when it stands for something else. Something is meaningful to an animal or a system if it helps it to continue. Molecule shapes limit the way they can join together. Some shapes are like other shapes so they can interact more easily. This is a bias based on relative similarity. In the immune system, these are meaningful biases because they help maintain the animal. Meaning is always related to a way of being. When something is like something else, when something is near something else, there's a greater chance of spontaneous differentiation, of pattern forming out of formlessness. It's not coincidental that language, which we use to think and make choices, emerges out of similarity and contiguity. The kind of causality that we're talking about behind purpose could be called semiotic causality, involving relations and meaning. Autocatalyst is the name of a type of chemical reaction that uses formal constraints to produce what it needs to maintain itself. It's self-maintaining. As long as there is an energy supply, it can make the stuff it needs to continue to make the stuff it needs. There are a lot of examples in nature. Nothing has to push the molecules together so that they can start their self-producing process. The inertia of the molecular soup provides the possibility that the molecules will meet up by chance. Here's a very simple model of autocatalyst. Say we have a molecule that looks like an L and a molecule that looks like a T. We have both upside down and right side up letters. If two L's or two T's meet up, nothing changes because they can't interact. Also, if you combine a T and an L in certain orientations, still there's no change. But when T's and L's meet and combine in other ways, they can interact and undergo change. For instance, if a right side up T joins with an upside down L, the T can turn into an upside down L. If an upside down L meets up with a right side up T, the L can turn into a T. It depends on the orientation when they happen to meet up. More T's might be produced or more L's depending on how things go. Because T and L molecules are moving around via inertia, the way they happen to meet up is just by chance. The production of new L molecules or new T molecules is equally likely. And you would think that this reaction scenario would just tend to kind of average itself out, but that's not what happens. Instead, differentiation occurs. If L equals black and T equals white, the random mix might go from an all over gray pattern to a black and white spot pattern. This is because T clumps have produced more T's and L clumps have produced more L's. You could say, that the clumps are self-sustaining systems. The clumps have grown as if by choice. If this is starting to sound like I'm personifying a lifeless chemical reaction, that's because I'm personifying a lifeless chemical reaction. This isn't life yet, far from it, but you can see the kind of behavior here that's starting to look like choice because assuming that a clump's purpose would be to sustain itself and grow, then it looks like it's doing that by choice. That's a crazy assumption, I know. But if animals have evolved the ability to make choices, lesser versions of it must have started somewhere. Now imagine that this spontaneous, self-maintaining, system-building kind of process makes 
proteins or perform some sort of useful metabolic activity or it can make copies of itself using a crystal template. If these different processes were cobbled together, you would have a very complex, robust system. Our bodies are made up of countless self-sustaining interconnected systems that have been cobbled together over evolutionary time, kind of like a Rube Goldberg machine. Such a system, even the most simplest complex system, would not likely have fallen together by chance, but if it did, its chances of evolving and staying together are actually pretty good. Back in the 18th century, Immanuel Kant considered the idea that particles of matter flying around might happen to fall into some kind of pattern, but not having a theory of selective retention, like the one I'm talking about here. He said that it would be a lucky accident that would hardly ever come about. He never really made the connection between chance and constraints, so his theory of final cause, of how we or nature might act purposefully, remain mysterious. So what we call final cause is the selective retention of biases. Remember Aristotle's four causes? Yep, he was pretty much on the right track after all. Final cause involves feedback, a process happening over and over and over again, every time improving the chances that it can continue to go on. Imagine that your thoughts are self-organized, moving, changing neuronal patterns. These patterns can also be selectively retained or not, depending on how various thought patterns reciprocally support each other or not. Your personality is a habitual collection of thoughts that tend to fall into similar patterns, and these habits constrain the possibility of your responses to things. When you act purposely, when you act by choice, the physical structures in your body and your habits make it more likely for your body to do the kind of thing that will sustain you, that the kind of thing that's consistent with the person you are. Sometimes your neuronal patterns can become so entrenched in the same old patterns that you seem to act like a machine. Other times your neuronal patterns can jump to a new kind of pattern easily through some sort of chance association. This is when you are at your most creative. As James Joyce said, a man of genius makes no mistakes. His errors are volitional and are the portals to discovery. I'll be talking more about creativity in future videos, but for now you know that it's not a humunculus like self, making you choose A instead of B by throwing some kind of switch. Making a choice is the result of enormously complex constraints on the probability of converging upon that particular solution that is you. And that's how you choose. Be sure to comment, like, and subscribe so you can see future videos on other interesting topics like chance, teleology, insect mimicry, the importance of making mistakes, and a whole host of other complex and controversial topics. Thanks for watching!